We are in Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. And let's, uh, well, let's pray before we get started. Lord, thanks uh, again for, for your love for us. Thank you for your word. God, thank you uh, for the fact that um, as we go through the Old Testament, especially uh, Book of Numbers, Book of Exodus, these, these passages, uh, Lord, you said that you've written these things for our learning um, and so that we wouldn't have to go through the same things uh, that these people go through. You bring us out of the world just like you brought them out of Egypt, and uh, you take them to the pro- you take us to the promised land, uh, you know, a place where we have victory in our in our walk with you. And and sometimes we rebel against that and end up doing laps in the wilderness. And uh, uh, but Lord, you're good, and uh, you finally get us there. Uh, we just pray that uh, again that as we're going through and looking at these stories, that we learn from them, and Lord, that our walks with you. Uh, would be something that's not only a blessing to us, but just pleasing to you, Lord. That's what we want to do. We want to please you. And so just give me wisdom as we're going through and talking about uh, these things tonight. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd speak to our hearts as we go through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, book of Numbers. We only got uh, a, a few verses into, into chapter 20. Actually, uh, we got to the sin of Moses. And you'll remember that um, as they're uh, going through the wilderness, actually, they're, they're about to um, come back. Uh, this, the second generation is about to come into the land of Israel. There's a, there's a little bit of traveling that they've got to do. Uh, but one of the, the first uh, responses after nearly 38 years in the wilderness is for these guys to start griping about water again. And when they gripe about water, uh, Moses goes to the Lord. The Lord says, this is what I want you to do. There's a rock over there. I want you to go speak to the rock. And when you speak to the rock, then water will come out and, uh, and so forth. And so what Moses does is he um, gets frustrated. And, I, you know, I'm on Moses' side. 38 years with these people you know, running around in the wilderness. 40 total, uh, you know, and... and uh, it's 38 since Mount Sinai, and 40 years with these people. And, you know, I, I've been uh, the pastor here for 30 years. This year is our 30th year um, here in the Tri-Cities, and the, the fellowship started in my house, okay? So for 30 years I've been here, and you guys don't gripe at me. And, you know, you don't do stupid things, and, you know, like, I don't know, worship calves and... And, and things like that. You don't, you don't do those things. And, and you know, I, I can't imagine being a ground, a, around a group of people for, for, you know, just 30 years where nothing, where it's nothing but one drama after another drama, one gripe after another gripe, you know, that kind of thing, and then have another 10 years to go. And, uh, you know, so when I when I look at Moses, I feel really bad for him, because I can I can see um, how you would get pretty frustrated. And what we've got here is Moses gets frustrated. And so, in verse nine, it says, "So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him." That's the rod of Aaron. Uh, it was originally the rod of Moses. Moses handed it over to Aaron. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, "Here now, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock?" And uh, Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation their animals drank. And then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. And so, you know, there's, there's some problems here with Moses. God's not mad. God doesn't call them rebels. Moses does. Uh, Moses is the one who's mad here. And God's the one who does the miracles. Moses takes credit for that. You don't take the glory from God. And then finally, you know, we talked about Moses wrecking the type. And so God takes Moses out to the woodshed or to the bathroom. My, my wife always took our children to the bathroom when there was discipline to be done. And so now they're still, you know, going, going to the bathroom, they're afraid of it. And 
I never knew why she did this. You know, it's like, it's like when I was going to discipline the kids, like, you know, I'd go into the bedroom, we'd sit on the bed, we'd have a talk, and then whatever n discipline needed to be done would be done. Bobby always went to the bathroom. Why did you go to the bathroom? No, it's just, yeah, okay, whatever. So, so my, my daughter, when she goes to the bathroom, she tentatively grabs the, no, nothing like that. But, you know, one of, the, one of the things that you have with God, and this is the, the, one of the issues that I, um, I didn't deal with last week. One of the issues that you have with God is that God is no respecter of persons. And so uh, all the way through the book of Numbers, God's been disciplining the people of Israel for their bad attitudes and uh, for their rebellion against God and all of that stuff. And Moses is somebody who's more accountable than anybody in the, you know, in the place. In the, the, he's more accountable than any in the building. The New Testament uh, talks about in James chapter 3, don't many of you become teachers because you're going to be more accountable to God. Your condemnation, it says, is going to be greater. And it's because the more you know, the more you're accountable for. And so God's not any respecter of persons, but what the Bible says is that um, God holds people accountable for what they know. And so in this, in this story, what's happening is God's diminished by Moses' bad behavior. And so, uh, again, Moses doesn't go with them into the promised land. And so then it moves on in verse 14. And you remember we, we talked about the fact that he does finally get there. Matthew chapter 17, he's in the promised land with Jesus on Mount Hermon. It's, it's, it's a cool thing. So in verse 14, it says, Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardship that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers. When we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us up out of Egypt, now here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink water from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We'll not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we've passed through your territory. Then Edom said to him, you shall not pass through my land lest I come out against you with the sword. So the children of Israel said to him, we will go by the highway. And if I or my li livestock drink any of your water, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. Then he said, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. Um, when, you, when you first start this, basically Moses is sending, sending a uh, delegation to the king of Edom, and he goes through and he talks about uh, their relationship, um, basically. He says, you know all the hardship that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt and we dwelt in Egypt a long time. You know, is what he's saying there. Well, why would the king of Edom know that? And the reason is because the Edomites are related to the Israelis. And, and so when you're, when you're talking about Edom, uh, the word Edom means red. And it actually comes from Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. Jacob gets his name changed to Israel, and that's where you get the Israelites. Okay? So they are the, uh, Israel is the father of the 12 sons of Israel, and each one of those sons had a bunch of kids, and those kids become the tribes of Israel. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, it's also called the 12 tribes of Jacob. When you, go, when you go through the Bible, Jacob and Israel are inter interchangeable. Well, Jacob had a twin brother, Esau. And Esau was a guy, actually, he had red hair. He was a hairy all over. He had red hair. And not only that, he sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. And the beans were red. And so red stuck to, red stuck to Esau. So when he went down and uh, set up his kingdom... He went down uh, towards, uh, down past the sea, uh, or the Dead Sea, and um, uh, in what we would call Southern Jordan nowadays, and that's where the kingdom of Edom was. And so the Edomites are related, again, to the Israelis. And so Moses, when he sends this delegation to them with a message, he expects that, you know, hopefully the Edomites are going to have some kind of mercy on them as they pass through. 
When you get to the book of Deuteronomy, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2 and chapter 3, one of the things that God says to the people of Israel uh, during this time is that they're not to do anything to the Edomites. The Edomites are not to be their enemies. And specifically, it talks about the fact that the Edomites, God put the place them in, those, in, the, in that place, and he used them to get rid of giants in their land. So remember when they went in, you know, went in from Kadesh Barnea and they said that there are, there are giants in the land? Well, it was the same thing in the land of Edom. And so the Edomites went in and, and took out these giants. And so God, therefore, says, I don't want you to molest the Edomites. You leave them alone. And so Moses sends a delegation. When he sends his delegation with a, with a message, uh, they refuse. Um, and they refuse with a threat. And so he sends another delegation with another message saying, we'll, we'll just go by the king's highway. And that's, a, that's an area that went uh, basically straight across uh, the northern part of uh, the Sinai Peninsula, went straight over into Edom, and then went north, uh, going up towards Damascus. And they said, we'll just stay on the highway. We're not going to go off to the right or to the left. And uh, and it'll be okay. You know, we're, if we take anything, we'll pay you for it. And still, they said no, and what they did was they came out and they met them with an army, basically. Now, they're in Kadesh when they send this message. Kadesh Barnea is, is the, the place where uh, they blew it with the 12 spies and, and that whole thing. And so they had been wandering around in the Sinai Peninsula for 38 years, and they end up back where they started. And uh, in the passage here, he talks about the fact that they're on the edge, they're in Kadesh on the edge of their border, okay? Um, that's not actually the kingdom of Edom at that point, but it was a place where the Edomites basically roamed. You have the same thing with the Midianites in, in the Bible. So the Midianites are usually over in the area that we would call Saudi Arabia and uh, southern Edom and those areas, but uh, the Midianites would wander over in the Sinai Peninsula. It's on the other side of a tongue of the Red Sea uh, that goes up to a lot. Well, you have the same thing with the Edomites. The Edomites roamed uh, through what was called the Arabah, and sorry for all the names, but the Arabah is an area that's south of the Dead Sea, and so they would roam all over that. It wasn't actually their territory. It became their territory later on, though, and so when, when, you're, when you're talking about Edomites, they, are, they live in the area uh, in southern Jordan where Petra is. And one of the things that happened over history was that there were some uh, 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 nomadic peoples uh, that came in and drove the Edomites out of their ancestral land, which is where these guys are talking about, and they drove them over towards the area of Kadesh Barnea. And that became an area called Idumea, I-D-U-M-E-A, Idumea, right? And it was connected again with the Jews. In fact, the Idumeans began to marry into the priestly tribes, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, actually the Sanhedrin, they began to marry into the Sanhedrin and actually some of the Idumeans became kings of, of Judah. And so one very famous Idumean that became a king of Judah was Herod the Great. So the Edomites become the Edomians, and literally Kadesh Barnea, you know, is right in the middle of their kingdom uh, towards the time of the Roman Empire. And so it's an interesting history. Um, as you go through the Old Testament, uh, the, it starts off with, a, uh, with uh, Edom and Israel. It starts off with a whole situation between Jacob and Esau. And again, that's Edom and Israel. Jacob and Esau, and there's, there's conflict between the two brothers. And so Esau is the favorite of his dad, Isaac, and Jacob is the favorite of his mom. And then, you know, he's a mama's boy. And uh, he was, he was a mama's boy. And he was totally manipulative. And so was his mom. And so basically what ends up happening with Esau and, and Jacob is uh, Jacob manipulates the guy and Esau is not without fault in that because he doesn't care about the things of God. And so what ends up happening is Jacob ends up taking both the birthright and the blessing uh, from Esau, ticked Esau off and um, he said, next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. 
and 20 years later, um, they, they have a, a, a situation where they reunite um, and not without some threat because when Esau comes to see Jacob, he's coming with 400 guys. Doesn't send a message saying, hi, I'm just coming with 400 guys, no big deal. He just comes with 400 guys. And, and so, but uh, they reconcile and, and that kind of thing. But there was conflict between Edom and Israel all the way through the Old Testament. So there were times when Israel was over Edom. Edom was never really over Israel. You know, every once in a while, you know, there'd be, you know, there was some time during the judges where uh, Edom, the Edomites um, uh, kind of had sway over Israel. But um, there was always conflict between the two groups, and the Edomites betrayed Israel uh, to the Babylonians, uh, betray, betrayed Judah to the Babylonians. And when you get towards the end of the Old Testament, Obadiah, the book of Obadiah, is all about the Edomites. And how you can remember uh, what's in the book of Obadiah is the, the first four letters, O-B-A-D, O-Bad. And it's, it's really bad for the Edomites. And God says that he's going to destroy them because of, uh, because of what they've done. Uh, when you get to uh, the book, the last book in the Bible, uh, uh, in the Old Testament Bible, um, the book of Malachi, that's the passage where it says, Jacob I have loved, talking about Israel, Esau I have hated. And it's because of the whole interchange between the Edomites and Israel. Amos 1.11 says this, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword, cast off all pity, his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. And so you see some of that, uh, some of that attitude in this situation with uh, the people of Israel. They're coming out of Egypt. They are, they are closely related and the Edomites have no pity on these people. Um, they, they don't want to have anything to do with them. And so because of the obstinacy and the cruelty of Jacob's brother, they end up uh, being judged. So they travel, uh, they end up traveling on the border of Edom, and that would be directly south of the Dead Sea. And so there's a, there's a, a, a large area of land that goes from the, the tongue of the Red Sea up to the bottom of the Dead Sea, and that's basically Western Edomite controlled area. That's where the armies would have come out and stopped them because the actual king, kingdom of Edom is over to the east of that. Yeah, Joe. You know, I don't know that there are any Edomites left. One of the, yeah. oh, at this time, you mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like this, and it was like this during uh, the during the time of Moses. Bad blood between the two because uh, because of the of the history, and even later on, you you have some of the stuff going on during the time of David, uh, and Saul, those those guys, and and later on, uh, at the end of the kingdom of of Judah, when the Babylonians come in, and so when you're going through the minor prophets, I just read from Amos. And uh, when you're going through uh, the book of Malachi, those are reactions to some of the things that the Edomites did to the Israelis uh, when, the, when the Babylonians came and took over, Assyrians too, and, uh, and, and that whole thing. Yeah, so there's bad blood for a long time over that. Is that good? Okay. And so Edom refuses to give Israel passage. And then you have verse 22, it says, Now the children of Israel... The whole congregation journeyed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have given to the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. And that's, that's interesting. I, I, you know, I, I like the phrasing there. You rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. You don't see an absolute rebellion by Moses or Aaron in, in that story. What you see is an incomplete obedience in that story. What God had told them was, don't strike the rock, speak to the rock. And they did exactly the opposite. They struck the rock. Um, that's, that's, a, that's obviously a form of rebellion, but they're still going to the rock. And that whole attitude that's going on there with Moses taking credit and Moses being, being mad when God's not mad, 
God takes the, the experience of Moses and he, again, he holds him accountable for all of that. Aaron too. And he says, that was a rebellion to me. And so one of the, one of the things that I keep in mind is, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at, at younger Christians, uh, a lot of times younger Christians are just fumbling around trying to do something. And they're, you know, they're constantly making mistakes and, you know, sometimes they're scared and they don't do the right thing and, and that, kind of, that kind of thing. And I don't, I don't really count that as rebellion. I don't look at that and just go, you know, oh, you're so stupid. Why didn't you just do exactly what God told you to? You know, although you should, obviously. And you are stupid. You know, it's like, we're all stupid. We do stupid things all the time. But, you know, I don't, I don't think God has that attitude towards people. Now, here I am. I got saved in 1975. And so 45 years later, Steve has a little bit more accountability than somebody who's been a Christian for, you know, six months. Steve's got a little bit more accountable than, uh, accountability than somebody who's been a Christian for, you know, two or three years, right? And so God comes along, tells me to do something, and I'm all like, oh, well, I don't really want to, and that's not really comfortable. And, you know, I do it halfway and stuff. I'm going to get a whole different attitude from God than somebody who's a brand new believer, aren't I? You know, and that's, that's just right. And so God considered it rebellion by Moses because by Moses and Aaron, Aaron was involved in the whole thing because there was an inc incomplete uh, obedience. He just did, they just didn't do it the way that the Lord told them to, and they should have. So older you get, more accountable you are. More you know, the more accountable you are. And, um, you know, I, I, I treat my two-year-old different than I treat my 12-year-old. I treat my 12-year-old different than I do my 24-year-old. And it's, it's that kind of thing with God, too. And so if you're, if you're wondering sometimes why God's getting a little more intense with you, maybe he expects you to know more and act accordingly, right? And that's valid. And it's actually a compliment. It's a good thing. He goes on, verse 25, and he says, Take Aaron and Eleazar, his son, and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them on Eleazar, his son. He's talking about his outer garments. He's talking about the priestly robes and stuff. He didn't leave Aaron naked there. <laughs> but strip, uh, put them on Eleazar, his son, for Aaron shall be gathered to his people and die there. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded, and they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar, his son. And Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. This guy's 123 years old when he dies. He dies there on top of the mountain. And uh, then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. Now when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, all the house of Israel mourned for Aaron uh, for 30 days. Can you imagine God telling you the day that you're going to die? I kind of think that would be cool. Okay, Steve, you know, next month, on the 15th day of the month, that's it, buddy. That's all. You know, what would your life be like if God did that? What would you be doing? Who would you be talking to? You know, the last words that, you, that you've got to say. And I just, you know, I just kind of, I just kind of think it, uh, I don't know. I, I, um, I, I kind of think that I wouldn't be all that fearful, but I don't know that because I've never been in the position. But, you know, the older I'm getting, the more I'm kind of looking forward to going home. Like, seriously, I'm looking forward to it. And I want to go in the rapture. And I think that's what's going to happen um, because Jesus is probably going to come back before I finish this sentence. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> and so, but still, you know, um, there, there, there's coming a time when, you know, it's, a, it's the end of your life. And um, I kind of hope that God kind of, you know, that he tells me. That would be cool. Just, you know, this is the day you're coming home, Steve. This is the day I'm going to see you. This is the day you, you take your last step out of this life and your first step into a bigger eternity. And so Aaron goes up on the top of the mountain, takes his, takes his uh, clothes off, and uh, passes them on to his son. And I think that's a completely, that's a, that's a great thing. You're, you're supposed to be passing the ministry that you have on to your son. And that doesn't mean that your son has to be exactly like you. But I want my son to follow Jesus. I want my son to love him. I want my son to have the, have the same heart or a better heart than I have towards the Lord. I want him to hear God's voice better than I do. 
I want him to be a man of God. And, um, you know, when I, when I look at this, you know, uh, there's, there's probably a big difference in me looking at this when I was a younger Christian and, and death was something far off and, and me looking at it now uh, in the sense of, you know, maybe even fear and, and all of that kind of thing. Now I look at it and I'm just like, what a cool thing to be able to do. You take off your priestly robes, you place it on your son. And, and Elias are, this is you, Bucky, now. This is you for the rest of your life. You know, do it well. Be a man of God. Very, very cool thing. In any case, um, that's what we want. We want our children, our, our sons, our daughters to be a man who loves Jesus like you or a woman who loves Jesus like you. Um, here's another thing. Your children are likely to love Jesus like you do. Is that good? You know what I mean? They're likely to love Jesus just like you do. And so if you love him the way that the Bible says, it's going to be an awesome thing for your kid. If they, if, uh, if, if it's a situation where you hear that and you're like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't know if that's good. You know, it's something that you might want to look at as far as your own life goes. And so they mourn uh, Aaron for 30 days. You know the 30-day mourning thing? I like, I, I like that, too. I like that. Because I've known some people who mourn for way too long just way too long. Their whole life is, is wrapped up in somebody who's gone home to be with the Lord. And it's, uh, and I don't want to be, you know, un uncompassionate about that because, uh, you know, there, there have pe been people that I've lost in my life. I still think about them and, and that kind of thing, but it's not incapacitating. And um, especially those that have died and gone home to be with the Lord, you know, a lot of the people in my life, that's exactly what has happened. They've gone to be home with the Lord. And I think that many times we need to get a, like a biblical perspective on this stuff. Um, really, the, the vast majority of my life, I'm going to be spending with them. When I go home to be with the Lord, that's, that's the rest of eternity. And so some of my family members that have died, my mom, my, my grandmother, uh, the, those people who knew Jesus, I'm going to be with them for the rest of eternity. And so there's a, a proper period of mourning, but we don't mourn like others um, who have no hope. We've got a hope, and our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in the fact that we're going to see our family members again. It's because of that. It's really important that our family members know Jesus. I can't imagine going to heaven without my daughter. I can't imagine going to heaven without my son. And so consequently, when there have been problems with my son or my daughter's walk with God, it's, it, it's a priority with me. It's something that I focus on. It's something that I do something about. I get on it. I do something about it. And, and God's always been faithful. Sometimes the thing that I'm doing is fasting and praying for them. Sometimes the thing I'm doing is going and getting them. Sometimes, you know, it depends on, on the situation. But I'm going to do something. You know, because I don't want to. I don't want to be in heaven without them, and and so uh, again, you have this this morning for thirty days, and then they move on, and they move on. A biblical perspective, I think that's a good thing. He goes, um, uh, uh, we go on into chapter twenty-one, and you have Israel going on, and all through this chapter. Uh, we have Israel walking in victory. One of the, one of the things that happens um, in ministry is that God will bury his workmen, but his work goes on. And so there, there's nobody on this planet that is um, irreplaceable. Nobody on this planet they, you know, that, that God needs. And so Aaron is the first priest of Israel and God used him in, in very cool ways, um, and now he's going to use his son Eleazar. Moses is going to end up dying uh, by the time, uh, when, well, he ends up dying at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and God replaces him with Joshua. And Joshua moves on, right? And so God may bury his workmen, 
but God's work is always going to go on. And uh, again, that's something to keep in mind. If the work doesn't go on, I wonder if it was God's. You know what I mean? Sometimes ministry is based on uh, uh, the charisma of a person. Sometimes it's based on uh, what a person builds up. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like we have that here at Calvary in the sense that, you know, I, I don't know if you, if you knew this, but uh, um, there's, this, there's $2 million on me if I die. I have to have the, the banks made me do $2 million of insurance if I die. And what they want is for the, the uh, payment of the, you know, for the buildings, for the mortgage and that kind of stuff to go on. Um, after I croak, and so that's what they wanted. Um, they they said if I will name a successor, then they'll lower it to one million dollars. But what they're what they're doing is they're covering themselves because they know that many times a ministry is built on the personality of the teacher. And one of the things that that I like about our fellowship is that I you know I really feel like I could croak and we got a couple of different guys that could you know get up here and start teaching and everything would be fine and you know you'd miss me for a month and that's that's what you would do right you'd miss me for a month <laughs> at least a month right <laughs> and then we move on because, because it's, not, it's not based on my personality. It's based on the teaching of the Word of God. It's based on getting into the Bible and following after Jesus. And that's the way that it's, uh, again, supposed to be. Um, yeah, enough said about that. In any case, in chapter 21, it says, The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharim, and so these, uh, many of these places we don't know anymore because the, the, the towns and the landmarks are very ancient. And so we don't know exactly where these places are. But in any case, Israel was coming on the road to Atharim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah. And so you have victory over Arad the Canaanite. Um, the vow here is made based on the word of God. It's made based on the word of God. One of the things that God had sent them to Canaan to do was take out the Canaanites. And so God was going to drive the Canaanites out because of their sin, uh, against the Lord and against actually their own people for the last 600 or so years. And so now it's time for judgment to come and God was going to use Israel as the hammer that drove out Canaan, right? And so um, when this attack comes, they go and pray and they, they pray based on the word of God. It's something that we're supposed to be doing. If I pray according to the will of God, I know that God hears me, and if God hears me, I know that I have the requests that I've asked of him, it says in 1 John. And so when we're praying, we need, to, we need to have some kind of measure of whether or not this is God's will. And it obviously, it doesn't have to happen every time. Sometimes we don't know the will of God, and it's why we're praying. But many times when, when I'm looking at the issues that come up uh, in my life, those issues are things that are, that are flat out talked about in the Bible, and so when I have issues with my marriage, does God have lots of stuff to say about marriage? Does God have lots of stuff to say about what a husband's supposed to do in a marriage? What a wife is supposed to do in a marriage, right? Does God have, have stuff to say about money? You have financial issues. Does God have stuff to say about money? Does he have a lot to say about it? You know that, that Jesus talked more about money in hell than anybody in the Bible? So Jesus had a lot to say about money. So God's got lots, lots to say about money and the way that we're supposed to be dealing with our finances. And so one of the things that I, I learned early on is to pray according to the will of God. Pray, pray according to what the word of God has to say. And there were many times when I was praying about my finances and God would just speak to my heart and go, Steve, are you doing the things that I've called you to do with those things? And I have to go, well, no, I'm not. And God, God would go, yeah, I want to take care of you, but go do what I told you to with those things. And when I would do that, 
then many times I would pray and God would answer my prayers. Jesus, uh, one of my favorite passages, passages is, is in uh, Matthew chapter 6 where God says that if you will seek me and my kingdom, my righteousness, then all these things will be added to you. And he's talking about taking care of me financially, taking care of food, taking care of clothing, taking care of my needs. But what I needed to be doing is seeking him first in his righteousness. And then all those things will be added to me. And there's been many a time where I've been praying about financial issues and, and God's just gone, you know, Steve, are you seeking me first? Are you seeking my righteousness first? And I have to go, nope, I'm not. What I'm doing is seeking, you know, a handout from you. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. And got to get my head squared away. And then, um, then as I began walking in the way that God wanted me to, then God would do exactly what he promised. And so when we pray things, we need to, you know, have some kind of idea about what the Bible has to say about those things. And you pray, you plead the promises of God. An old guy told me one time, you plead the promises of God. And when you're doing that, God will answer you. And so this is something that's obviously within God's will and God answers them. It is within God's will that you have victory in your life. It is within God's will that, get, that you conquer over the enemies of your walk with God, of your, of your life with the Lord, that you, that you win. It's God's will that you win all the time. It's God's will that you win. And so when, when you have something that's putting you into bondage, when you have, have, have something that's opposing you, and, and again, your walk with God, there is no reason to sit there and put up with it. And that can be a thought. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians that we bring every thought into captivity. So it can be your thought life. It can be your attitude towards yourself. You do realize what the Bible has to say about you. And there's a couple of things. We're all sinners, right? Okay, so is, that, is that done with now? We're all sinners, right? Can we handle that? And, and, and we don't do it right, right? Can we handle that? You're not a great person. Can we handle that? And I'm not talking about you compared to me. I'm talking about you compared to God. You compared to me, you might be a great person. Compared to God, not so much, right? So we're not great people. We're not good all the time. Uh, the thoughts and intents of our heart are always not, you know, crystal clean and practically perfect in every way, even if your name's Mary Poppins, right? You are not that. And so that's called being a sinner, and um, when you're a sinner, what do you deserve? What? Death. Yeah, death. You deserve to die. Okay, so anything else is gravy, man. <laughs> anything but death is gravy. That's, that, that's all good stuff. Does God want to kill you? Actually, yes, he does. He wants to kill you. He wants the person that you are to die so that, so that he can make something new out of you. And so we need to die to our flesh and we need to become like Christ. And so that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And so he does want me to die. So everything that Steve Winery is, all the, all the, all the wonderful things that Steve Winery has always been, need to, need to die so that Jesus can do something through me. You get that? Can we handle that one? All right. And so how does Jesus accomplish my death? And the way that he does it is by going to the cross. He dies in my place, and I die with him spiritually, and then he rises from the dead, and I rise with him, and now I've got a brand new life, and I'm not that man anymore. And that's how Jesus treats me. I'm not that man anymore. And I still have my moments. Stuff still comes up, and I'm still a jerk. I still, I continue. You know, every, every, you know, every once in a while, Steve, you know, the old Steve Winery pops out. There he is, in all his glory, mouthing off, doing whatever he's doing, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then he needs to die again, put him right back on the cross. And um, when, I, when I fall into those er arenas, fall into those areas, um, what I do, because I'm a righteous man, what I do is I go to the Lord and I ask him to forgive me, because that's what a righteous man does. A righteous man doesn't live perfectly because you can't. But a righteous man, when he fails, goes straight to the Lord, asks him for forgiveness, and you're righteous. That's what righteousness is about. 
Can we handle that one? It's the same thing with ladies. If you're a righteous lady, it doesn't mean you're perfect all the time and every you know, attitude of your heart has always been sweet and kind and wonderful because sometimes you're just not, right? And when you're not, you go to the Lord, you ask him to forgive you, you go, you go around, you make things right if you need to make them right, and then you move on. And the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all my sin and I'm made pure and I'm made righteous, I'm made holy and I'm made blameless in his sight as I continue in him, right? And that's where we live as Christians. It's a cool thing. And, and so what God wants, wants uh, for me is a life where I'm victorious, where I don't have to live the way that I lived before. I don't have to live in condemnation because the, all the condemnation went on Jesus, right? So I don't have to live in condemnation anymore. And yeah, all those things are true. You know, anytime Satan comes up to, you, to me and goes, you know what you are? Um, and he starts telling me about myself. I agree with him because most of the time he's telling the truth. And sometimes he's not even telling all of it. You know, it's like I, I just agree with him. But that's not the issue. That's what I was. That's what God's taken out of my life. Sometimes that's what I still am. Uh, the issue is what Jesus does with me. And so I don't find my worth in myself. It's not self-worth that I'm looking at. I find my worth in what Jesus has done for me. My, my worth is found in Christ. My worth is found in what Christ has changed in my life. There's a lot of things I look at in my life and I really like them. I really like them, you guys. I like, I li I like uh, certain attitudes that I have. I love them. Certain, certain actions that I've done over the years, I love them. You know why? Because of stuff that Jesus did in me. And so I don't, I don't take credit for those things. That's just stuff that Jesus did. And I love it. And you can see some of that with Paul. There are times when Paul's talking about his ministry, about his life, and about the things that he's done. And it looks like he's bragging, and he is. But he's not bragging on himself. He's bragging on what Jesus has done through him. And that's, that's how your mindset has to be. All the good stuff I've got going on, Jesus has been doing through me. And there's no reason not to praise God for that. All the bad stuff, Jesus takes care of that. He washes it away, he cleanses it. Sometimes he rebukes me for it. Sometimes he, you know, some, sometimes he points things out that I haven't seen before. And what he wants to do is perfect me. He wants, me, wants to bring me into a relationship with God where I'm like Christ, I'm, I'm Christ-like. And so, you know, I, I never have a situation where I don't have standing before God because Jesus already took my punishment upon himself. So I'm never in a situation where I'm like hunkering down going, God's going to kill me, God's going to wipe me out, God's going to you know, send me to hell or anything because, because I'm not a person who's walking outside of a relationship with Christ. I'm right smack in the middle of Jesus. And so God sees me positionally as being like Jesus. I'm going to heaven because Jesus traded places with me. That's why I'm going to heaven. But then there's the practical stuff. And the practical stuff includes I blow it, I ask God to forgive me. God does it because he, he tells the truth and he's always good. And then I pick it up and I walk on. Righteous man falls seven times and then rises up again. And that's our life. That's where we live. It's how you win. It's how you win. And so I'm, not, I'm never going around thinking I'm all that because I'm not. Never was, never will be. Uh, not until I go home to be with the Lord. And then it's all because of Jesus. So I never go, on, go around thinking I'm all that. But I do know that if I'm walking with Jesus, um, there's nothing that can stand against me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I know that. And so, there, you know, there, there's nothing that can come against me that God can't overcome. And that's where I sit. I win all the time. I win all the time if I'm walking with the Lord. And when I'm not winning, what's that telling me? I'm not walking with the Lord. So I need, I, I need to get back in the, in, the, in the place where I can have victory. It goes on in verse uh, uh, um, 4 and 5, and you have the people of Israel complaining again. It says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And this people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. 
And again, you have the children acting, acting like their parents. And so what God does is he disciplines them once again. And so you have the whole judgment with serpents. So verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came, out, came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he, that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And so you have the, the whole story of the making of the bronze serpent. You know, um, there are these times when I was growing up that I would be whining or crying, and my mom would say, keep crying, and I'm going to give you something to cry about, Right? I'm, or my dad would say that. And some of that's going on right here. Keep, keep complaining. I'm going to give you something to complain about. And so God sends, because of their complaints against God and against his provision, God sent serpents. It says fiery ones. Serpents, fiery ones. Um, and, and again, you've got you to put this in the context of what's happening. Every day is a miracle with these people. Every day they wake up, they go out, look on the ground, there's food that fell from heaven every single day. And the food for that, that falls from heaven is called angel's food. I'm feeding you with angel's food. And the Bible says that the food that fell from heaven was like wafers and honey um, dipped, in, uh, cooked in oil. Okay? Wafers and honey cooked in oil. Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's donuts. God's feeding these people donuts every day. You know, <laughs> just, it just cracks me up. And so God's just being over the top, blessing these people. And again, what they do is they start griping about the whole thing. And so God um, sends serpents there. Um, when, it, when it says fiery serpents here, it's really interesting because in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, it's exactly the same term that's used for the angels that stand around the throne of God. Check this out. Turn, turn over to Isaiah chapter 6. Have I told you guys this before? I, I, I don't know. I don't know that, that we've had a reason to uh, in the book of Numbers. But in Isaiah chapter 6, you have the seraphim. This is something I learned probably about 15 years ago, something like that. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah chapter 6, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood, stood seraphim. And that word seraphim means the burning ones. Um, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so it goes on, and Isaiah talks about being undone, and God does this whole thing where one of the seraphim fly to him and take a coal from the altar and touch his lips, and, uh, and he's cleansed from his sin. And so, cool thing, but that word seraphim is the same word that's used for the fiery serpents in this passage. So that's interesting. Because when you... When you look at the angels that are around the throne of God, we don't have a real description in that passage, but when you look at the angels that are around the throne of God, they exhibit um, aspects of their nature that point to Jesus. And so we've talked about this before with a cherubim. And uh, with, a, with, a cher with a cherub, it has four faces. Uh, one's a face of an ox, one's a face of an eagle, one's a face of a lion, one's a face of a man. And it represents the, the fourfold ministry of Christ. An ox being a servant, a man being the son of man, an eagle being the one from heaven, being God. What was the other one? Lion, lion of the tribe of Judah. Also goes with the four gospels, right? And so you guys know this, right? And so you, you have these animals pictured on angels that are there 
the Bible says, at the creation of the earth. So they have the animals' faces before the animals are ever made. So when you got a face of an ox on, a, on an angel, the ox was shaped after the angel, not vice versa. When you had the face of an eagle, the eagle was shaped after the, after the angel, not vice versa. And so before the animal kingdom was ever created, these angels were created. Well, you got another thing going on with the seraphim, because in this passage, they're burning fiery serpents. And if that's the same, if that's the same language that's being used in Isaiah 6, then there's something serpentine about those angels. And you see this, uh, for example, with, with uh, um, Lucifer. It talks about Lucifer uh, in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 28 being covered with, uh, basically with stones. And so there, there's, a, there's a covering on Lucifer, the, his body is something that, that shines with light and it's different reflections of light that's going on. And so I kind of wonder if that's not what's happening there. And the ox and the angel, and, or excuse me, the ox and the eagle and all these other animals are picturing a work of Christ and you have exactly the same thing with the burning fiery serpents. Did you know that Jesus is a snake? You get to the New Testament in, in um, John chapter 3. Turn over with me to John chapter 3. Starting in verse 13. It says, No one has ascended to heaven but who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should, have, uh, should not perish, but have eternal life. And so Jesus takes this picture of, out of the Old Testament of the bronze serpent being put up on a pole, and he says, that's me. Just like Moses put up the serpent on the pole, I have to be lifted up. So what's a the picture there? And later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus, when he goes up on the cross, is a type of sin. He's a type of, he's a, he's a type of and I don't mean a type of sin in, 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 in the idea of uh, he is sin or one kind of sin. I mean like a picture of sin being put on, you know, the serpent being on the pole is a picture of the fact that the thing that was killing the people of Israel is the thing that gets put up on the pole. It's made into bronze because bronze is something that symbolizes the wrath of God. The wrath of God coming down on the thing that is killing the people of Israel. And if they will look at the thing that's up on the pole, that's a picture of the thing that's killing them, then they'll be healed from the bite of the actual thing. The sin, basically. And so Jesus is being pictured as being sin put up on a pole. Now, was Jesus sin? No. Uh, actually, in the, in the passage in 2 Corinthians 5, the term that's used there is a sin offering. And sin offerings were always holy. But when you, when you put your hand on one of the animals that was going to be sacrificed in the Old Testament, it was a picture of your guilt, your sin passing from you to that animal. And that animal takes the punishment for your sin, even though the animal is innocent. It's exactly the same thing with Jesus. And so Jesus goes, I'm like a snake on a pole. And that's what's happening. The snake is, is obviously sin. The snake is obviously the thing that's keeping us from eternal life. And what Jesus does is he takes it away. This is, this is also interesting in the sense that when Satan appears to the woman in the Garden of Eden, what's he appear as? Yeah, a serpent. And that's interesting because uh, uh, apparently there's something, there's something going on there. And I, don't, I don't claim to know everything about it, but there's something going on there. And it looks like that whole aspect has been twisted. It was twisted by Satan. He used it to make himself attractive to Eve in that situation. I think they probably used an actual serpent and, and did that whole thing. But there's this whole weird thing where God takes and not only does he picture 
in uh, Jesus as, as being, or uh, the angels as being these different animals in mankind that represents Christ. But that whole serpentine thing, if that's what's going on in Isaiah chapter 6, also represents Christ in the sense that um, he became sin for me. So that I could become the righteousness of God in him. Kind of kind of interesting stuff. In any case, what happens is they, they look to the bronze serpent and anyone who looked at the bronze serpent lived back in, back in the book of Numbers. So how easy, how hard, let's put it that way, is it to be saved from a, a malady that's going to kill you miserably? The reason they're called burning fiery serpents is because apparently the bite, the, the poison that's injected into them is something that hurt radically, right? And so how easy or how hard is it for them to be healed from that whole thing? And all it takes is looking, looking. And I think that God did that on purpose because a lot of times what we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna take the sacrifice of Christ and we wanna add something to it that comes from our own, uh, our, our own works, our own um, uh, effort. And it's Jesus plus my you know, five days of repentant crying that gets me forgiven for my sin. Or what Jesus did on the cross plus the fact that I'm going to give double my tithe this week and that will get me forgiven for my sin. Or Jesus plus, you know, and, and uh, plus the fact that I'll never do it again that's gonna get me forgiven for my sin. I had that attitude once when, when I was a young believer and I, I was talking to, to God about some, some issues with me, you know, repenting over and over for stuff. And this one time God speaks to me and he goes, Steve, what do you have to add to the blood of my son? You got anything that you can add to that? to the blood of Jesus. So it's Jesus plus me feeling bad for five days. Or Jesus plus me being really good from now on. Or Jesus plus me giving more money. Or Jesus plus me working down at the, you know, the homeless shelter. That'll get me forgiven. You, you don't have anything to add to the blood of Jesus. Once, to, once God gives his son for you, that's the, that's the highest payment that he could ever pay for your sin. And trying to add anything to that is ridiculous. And we've talked about this before. If, if, if it was a choice between you and my son, you'd lose every time. If I ever gave up my son for you, if he ever died for you, it's one of the, one of the most radical um, costs to me that could ever take place. And if you ever came up to me and offered me money because I allowed my son to die in your place, I'd be nothing but offended. If you ever came up to me and said, you know what, I know that you gave up your, gave up your son for me, and so let, you know, let me pay you back. I'll, I'll, I'll work at your place for the next year. I'd be going, shut your face. I'd be offended at that. See what I mean? Yeah, and a lot of times we get this, we get this, this concept in our head that, that I, I've gotta add stuff to that. And I'm not saying that you're not to be repentant, you are. And I'm not saying that you're not to be sorry, because you are. But you need to recognize that your repentance and your sorriness is not what's forgiving you. Your repentance and your sorriness is not what's making you clean, and it's not what's making God forgive you. It's what Jesus did for you that's doing this stuff, and you don't have anything to add to that. All you gotta do is look. All you have to do is look. It's not look plus put a tourniquet on. It's not look plus, you know, I don't know, uh, drink this concoction. It's not, look, it's not anything but look. And so you look to the one that's, that's on the pole. Um, there are some people who believe that this is where uh, you got the, um, oh, I'm blanking out. Uh, yeah, the caduceus. Um, that this is where you got that. And that's that, um, generally speaking, it's two serpents on a pole. And uh, it was a, a symbol of Escalapius. And uh, there are some people who believe that this is actually where it came from. And so, again, you have that. I can't remember when we started. Did anybody look? I don't know. Did you guys look? Okay, I think. I, you, know, you know when you, 
you know when you, uh, you'll, you'll see, when you go to the hospital and you see a doctor's tag and it's got that little kind of cross thing with a, with a serpents on it? Caduceus. Escalapius? Yeah, it's, a, it's a god of healing. It's a Greek, he's a Greek god of healing. Okay. And so that's where many people think that. Okay. Then you have, somebody else asks? Okay. Um, then you have verse 10. It says, now the children of Israel moved on and camped in Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth and camped in uh, um, Ijabirim in the wilderness, which is east of Moab, toward the sunrise. And so now, uh, actually, can you put that uh, picture up? So now what you've got them doing is, uh, we're over on the right side of the, of the screen right there. They've gone down to a lot, that's Ezi and Geber, and then they've moved up uh, the, the Arabah, that's that area south of uh, the Dead Sea, and they've gone up, and now they're going east of Edom. Uh, where it says Moab up there, that's where the Moabite kingdom was. And so now they're going to the east side of that and coming on up around uh, the area of Moab. And so it says, from there they moved and camped in the valley of Zered. From there they moved and camped on the other side of the Arnon. And that's a river that's going, uh, one of those rivers, the main river that's going um, east to west up there where that, air, where that green arrow ends up up by Debon. And so that's the Arnon. Uh, and it says, uh, which is in the border uh, or in the wilderness that extends from the border of the Amorites, for the Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. The Amorites is one of the kingdoms uh, that has people in Canaan. Therefore, it's said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waheb and Sufa, the brooks of the Arnon and the slope of the brooks that reaches to the dwelling of Ar, and lies on the border of Moab. And you ask me, Steve, what are the books of the war, book of the wars of the Lord? Where's that at? And that's right between um, uh, Second Flesholonians and the book of Hezekiah. <laughs> have you ever had anybody do that to you? Go up to new Christians and go, hey, have you read the book of Hezekiah yet? And they go, no, I haven't read that word, you know. Uh, but, I'm, you know, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. <laughs> There's no such thing as the book of Hezekiah. You know, that, that kind of thing. This is, uh, there are a number of uh, books that you have, especially in the Old Testament, that are referred to. And this is one of those books that's referred to. The book, uh, book of the Wars of the Lord. And you have a quote from that book that's put here into the book of Numbers. But we don't have the book itself anymore. And um, whenever, you're, whenever you're talking about the books of the Bible and things that should be in the Bible, um, you, this is called canonicity, and it's the idea of, of books that meet the standard. And so there are some books that are mentioned that don't meet the standard. There are quotes from some books that don't meet the standard. And the fact that there's a quote doesn't mean that the whole book is okay. And sometimes... When you think that there's a quote from a book, it may be a quote that's, that's not actually from the book, but the book itself may be quoting the same source that the Bible's quoting. And so there's some passages, in, uh, for example, in the book of Jude that people have said um, have come from the book of Enoch. And so there are people who say that the book of Enoch, maybe that should be in the Bible. And we don't know, actually, if it's, a, if it's actually a quote from the book of Enoch. Uh, because what the Bible says it's a, is it's a quote from Enoch himself um, who didn't write what we call the book of Enoch. It was written way too late. And so it's probably a quote from, from some, some other arena. Um, one of the things that you need to remember about books is just because they're ancient doesn't mean they belong in the Bible. Okay? So when you, when you go up to the bookstore, we've got a bookstore up there in the loft, and over on the left-hand side, I can, I can see the bookshelf right there. That bookshelf up there is full of Bibles. Those are Bibles. And then I can see the tops of bookshelves over on this side. And those books are full of commentaries. And some of them are reading books. And some of them are Bible atlases. Some of them are, you know, Bible uh, uh, concordances, that kind of things. That kind of thing. All kinds of books about the Bible. Some of them are Bible histories, but they're not Bibles, right? So you got Bibles, and then you got books about the Bible, and you got exactly the same thing in ancient times. And so some of the books that that you'll see when you're going through the Book of Kings, it'll talk about the chronicles of the kings of Israel, 
and there's information taken from those, but that doesn't mean that the chronicles of the books of the kings of Israel need to be in the Bible. You know, it's just the, the information that they take from it is something that's canonical. And so you just need to remember that. Just because a book's ancient doesn't mean it belongs in the Bible. And that's a situation that we have here. So verse 16, it says, from there uh, they went to beer, um, not, not Coors, um, to beer, it's a, <laughs> which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together and I'll give them water. Then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well. All of you sing to it. The well the leaders uh, sank, dug by the nation's nobles, by the lawgiver with their staves. And so um, after uh, they, they go around uh, Moab, they come to this place where you get water for the Lord. And there are three things that are mentioned in, in this passage. It talks about the fact that they gathered the people together. God said, gather the people together and I will give them water. That's exactly what happens with us. We gather together and we're going through the word. God gives us the water of the word and he, and he refreshes us with it. I don't know about you, but um, uh, you know, I'm not really in the position anymore because most of the time during the week, I've, I'm having a fine week because I work with Mitch and I, I work with Matt and I work with Zach and they're good guys. And I'm having a fine week. I'm not, I'm not often having a problem, right? Um, but when I was in construction, I was working with other guys. I'm not going to name them. I can remember their names, though. I was working with other guys, and that wasn't so fun, right? And by the time I would get halfway through the week, when I got to a Wednesday, I was feeling pretty low and pretty messed up and pretty filthy, actually, sometimes because of the language that's going on around me, sometimes because of the attitudes that are going on around me. I love going to Wednesday nights and just sitting down and receiving from the Lord, listening to, listening to the word of God and just letting it just kind of pour over me. It's like a shower, man. You know, there, there have been times when I've been so filthy, you know, just, just working on something and just gross filthy. Um, I've, I've had some times when I've been working in my septic tank you know, and hanging down inside there and doing things with baffles and stuff like that. Gross, disgusting, filthy. I was so thankful for a shower. And when I did the shower, I would, you know, I'm, I'm doing my hands and I'm, I'm kind of standing away and doing this and just washing my hands, getting my hands all clean, get my arms all clean. Don't let it touch the rest of my body because it's so gross, right? There have been times when I felt like that walking into church. It's feeling so gross. And then God just washes me with the water of the word. We talk about the things of God. We talk about what Jesus has done for us and um, just, just fills you up and, and blesses you. And that's the way that it's supposed to go. So gather the people. The water the water's where the people are. And so we need to be huddled up. Huddle up. People get dry when they're separate. People get wet when they get together. And uh, uh, again, get in the word. You have them singing out in the passage, spring up, oh well, all of you sing to it. And that's another thing that happens with us when we gather together, we sing out, we give praise. And then it talks about digging and the, the well the leaders sank. They, they dug a well, dug by the nation's nobles, by the lawgiver with their stays. And that's a great picture of digging into the word, which is again what we do. And from the wilderness, they went to Mat Matanah, from Matanah to Nahaliel, from Nahaliel to Bamoth, from Bamoth in the valley that is in the country of Moab, to the top of Pisgah, which looks down on the wasteland. And Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your land. We'll not turn aside into fields or vineyards. We will not drink water from wells. We will go by the king's highway until we've passed through your territory. But Sion would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. So Sion gathered all his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. Now Edom just brought their army out and basically planted on the border and, and threatened them. These guys come out and actually attack them. So then Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword, took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, as far as the people of Ammon, for the border of the people of Ammon was fortified. So Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the, of the Amorites, in Heshbon and in all its cities. For Heshbon was the city of Sion, king of the Amorites, 
who'd fought against the former king of Moab and had taken all his land from his hand as far as the Arnon. Therefore, those who speak in Proverbs say, come to Heshbon, let it be built. Let the city of Sion be repaired. For fire went out from Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sion. It consumed Ar of Moab, the Lord, lords of the heights of the Arnon. Woe to you, Moab. You have perished, O people of, uh, of Chemosh. He has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to Sion, king of the Amorites. But we have shot at them. Heshbon has perished as far as Dibon. Then we laid waste as far as Nopha, which reaches to Mediba. And what's, what's being talked about here is the fact that um, the uh, Sion, king of the Amorites, this is a kingdom again that's connected with uh, the people of Canaan. They came in and they conquered part of, part of Moab's territory. And when they conquered part of Moab's territory, they sang a song. And it's verses 27 down through 29. And so in this song, it's talking about the city of Sion will be repaired, that Sion's the king of the Amorites. There's a fire that went out from Heshbon, uh, a flame from the city of Sion. In other words, uh, it came out, came out from the Amorites attacking the Moabites. It consumed Ar. Woe to you, Moab. Woe to you, uh, uh, you have perished, O people of Chemosh. That was the national god of Moab. And he's given his sons and daughter, sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to Sion, king of the Amorites. And so the Israelis just took that little song that they were singing about conquering the Amorites, bragging song. You know, um, we've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? You know, a little bragging song that's going on. They took their bragging song, they added one more verse. And the last verse they added was, we've shot at them. Heshman has perished as far as Dibon, and we, uh, then we laid waste as far as Nopha, which reaches to Mediba. And so, Sion, king of, king of the Amorites, we took you out. We'll use your little song against you. Uh, Moab, by the way, is also related to the people of Israel. Moab is one of the sons of Lot. And so Abraham had a nephew named Lot, and he, uh, Lot actually um, ended up um, sleeping with one of his daughters, of all things. And, you know, gross, but that's what happened. And out, out came little Moab, and Moab had children, and that became the Moabites. So they're related to Israel, too. And so Israel's supposed to be taking out the Amorites, and they don't mind taking out Sion, king of the Amorites. And so it says, goes on to say, thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites, and then Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they took its villages and drove out the Amorites who were there. Let's finish this off. And they turned and went up by the way to Bashan. Bashan is what we would call uh, the Golan Heights. And they went to Bashan. So Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Edrei. Then the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him, for I've delivered him into your hand with all his people and his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon. So they defeated him, his sons, and all his people until there was no survivor left him, and they took possession of his land. And so you have uh, the land of Sion, uh, the king of the Amorites, the land of Og, uh, the king of Bashan, and it becomes Israeli territory. This is going to become important later on. Uh, because part of the tribes of Israel end up settling here uh, in, the, in this place. By the way, um, Sion, or excuse me, Og, king of Bashan, uh, was a remnant of the giants, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 3. And um, it does, doesn't identify how tall he was, but it says that his bed was 13 six by 6 feet across. Wow. Yeah, so he slept in a big bed. Either he was a little guy sleeping in a big bed, <laughs> but if he's one of the giants, then obviously you're talking about somebody who's probably, you know, somewhere around a 10 to 12 feet tall, and they take him out um, if he's sleeping in a 13 foot six bed. And so, again, victory. One victory after another victory after another victory. When you're fighting the enemies of God, you, you are supposed to be walking in victory. There are enemies of God in your life, and you are supposed to be walking in victory. Lust is an enemy of God. Pride is an enemy of God. Hatred, enemy of God. You know, and you can go, go through uh, the lists that we have in Galatians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. There's a number of things. Drunkenness, an enemy of God. Uh, drugs, enemy of God. There's no reason not to win over these things. 
no reason at all. And uh, jealousy, enemy of God, so on. Greed, all of those things are an enemy of God. There's no reason to put up with it in your life. So let's pray and get you out of here. Thanks again, Lord, for your word. Thank you. Thank you for the victory that you give to us. Um, Lord, we know that that victory is something that comes through the power of your Holy Spirit. Uh, there's, there, there's nothing we can do. You, you said this, Lord. Without me, you can do nothing. And Paul said that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Lord, we know that the victory that we have comes from you, comes from uh, a reliance and a dependence upon you. And God, that's exactly what we want. As we walk with you, as we walk in, in the center of your will, we know that we're, we're going to have the victory that you've called us to. We thank you for the fact that we've got a position in you where you're looking at us just like you look at Jesus, Lord. And that's an awesome thing. Lord, we pray, pray that you'd help us to be thankful for your provision for us in that, Lord, and for all the things that you give us. We love you, Lord. And uh, God, I just want to pray for your blessing on these people. Just pray that the rest of their week would just be centered on you, focused on you. And as we do that, Lord, uh, that the, the power of your spirit would be evident in our lives, Lord, not just in our lives, but in our attitudes, in our minds, and the things that comes out of our mouth, Lord, that we would just be honoring to you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for us. And uh, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you.